One of the mantras that we use when we are creating our content for an online humanities classroom is to think about the idea that anything can be done online. Now, there are some caveats to that, and I'll let Tracy speak to some of those because she's our expert course designer. Um, but to think about the things that we do in brick and mortar schools and how we translate them into that online environment we kind of have to go in with that mentality that anything that we do in a brick and mortar classroom can be accomplished online. It might just look a little bit different. I would add to that, Carly, that um, we have to think different too. You remember that old Apple motto, think different. Um, online teachers have to do that all the time because you know, we, we can't just translate what works in a brick and mortar classroom and immediately just turn it into a successful online lesson. We have to think about how that lesson's gonna um, hit on, online differently than it would in a brick and mortar classroom. So think different. One of the great myths about online education is that it is isolating and that students are not connected to each other or to their teachers when they attend classes online. And one thing that I've learned in the four years that I've been with the Davidson Academy Online is that that is absolutely not the truth. I am very connected to my students and they are very connected to one another. As Jessica mentioned, our classes are all offered in a combination of synchronous and asynchronous activities. So one of the ways that we'll kind of organize some of the talking points in today's presentation is by looking at how we're able to accomplish something synchronously as well as how we're able to accomplish it in an asynchronous situation. I know many of you might be coming from schools where you're not quite sure what the fall is going to look like and what your availability will be to have synchronous and asynchronous. So to give you kind of a feel for how we're able to do all of these things uh, in a way that's either all together at once in a Zoom meeting like this or some other platform or to be able to accomplish similar things in um, an asynchronous situation. So for getting to know the students or making those connections, there are several strategies that we utilize in the humanities classroom in particular um, in the synchronous classroom. And it's vital in a humanities classroom to connect with students and spend time doing that because that has to become a safe space for discussion because that is such a cornerstone to what we do in those classrooms. So in a synchronous situation, I rely on student interviews because we do have the opportunity to assess our students and we all as the humanities teachers participate in that assessment process. We start getting to know our students through interviews and the assessment process before they're even fully accepted into the program. So we get to know them from the very beginning. Um, we do icebreakers and we do them more than just on day one. Um, you're familiar with those types of activities where everybody's introducing one another to um, each other and being able to connect with each other and find similarities and differences and you know build that classroom community. We do them probably every couple of weeks we'll do some type of activity that's designed to get students talking to each other about more than just the content that we're learning. Several teachers utilize, I know in the math cl classrooms, they use the question of the day quite a bit. I think some of our humanities teachers do as well. Uh, I know a lot of the humanities teachers like to utilize the riddle of the day to kind of get students thinking and talking to one another. Um, we love rebus riddles in the history classroom for some reason. <laughs> they like to be able to solve those picture word puzzles. Um, and kind of think through it together and see the way different people think about things and get those different perspectives. It gets them talking to each other. I also like to incorporate in the first live session of the week some type of weekend update. Um, just taking 10 minutes out of that class time to be able to ask the students what they did this past weekend, what was fun, what was not. You can learn so much about your students and they can connect with each other so much by learning about what everyone's interested in outside of the classroom. Uh, and then I also work in one-on-one -on -one conferences frequently throughout the year. Um, in my history classroom, we meet almost every quarter in a one-on-one -on -one conference. And then um, in the English classrooms, we're meeting quite often in one-on-one -on -one conferences, specific, specifically to talk about writing. Um, but we learn a lot about each other in that situation as well. If you're not able to do some of those synchronous things, 
Um, asynchronously, you can still continue to build that learning community and engage your students with each other and with you. Um, it's really important to have teacher presence online. So don't just put your materials online and expect your students to be able to navigate and interact with those materials on their own. You need to be a part of their discussions that they're having online. You need to be communicating with them. You need to put your face and your voice on as much as you can online. Uh, we make a lot of our own videos and we uh, participate in the discussions that the students are having. So it's important for the teacher to be present in that asynchronous space. It's not a, I pushed go and I let it happen <laughs> type of a situation. I also like to utilize Flipgrid discussions as opposed to the written um, discussion boards that might be available in your LMS. Um, the reason why I utilize those more often is because it allows students to see each other's faces and hear voices instead of just reading the words. And that can go a long way in helping students to connect with each other. And again, remember as a teacher, you need to jump in on those too so that they see your face and hear your voice in those discussions. We also utilize a chat tool called Teams that allows for more informal conversation to take place. Um, and we see, I, I think of Teams as kind of like the hallway of our school. Uh, it's those conversations that happen that, you know, you pull a student aside in the hallway or you see students talking to each other in the hallway. And that kind of replicates that for us in the online space. And I'll reiterate again the importance of daily communication with your students. Um, we reach out to them in multiple ways through announcements in our LMS, Teams messages, um, emails, um, and even sometimes those one-on-one -on -one conferences, just making sure that we are jumping in and talking to the students each day. Um, and we frame all of that around a human-first approach where we think of our students as people first and students second so that we can approach them with empathy and with compassion. And that goes a long way towards building those relationships. Sorry about that little technical difficulty. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about student-centered learning and why it's so appropriate for an online humanity, humanities classroom. So student-centered learning is one of those educational buzzwords or, or buzz phrases that really is worth the hype. Student-centered classrooms include students in planning development, um, in, in assessment, it offers multiple paths through the curriculum, and it really engages them and it lets them feel like the classroom belongs to them. It's inherently personalized and it results in more developmentally appropriate and memorable educational experiences. Can you go ahead and move to the next slide, Tracy? Thank you. So I've offered a few ways that we as teachers can move from teacher-centered learning to student-centered learning. So first and foremost, um, the, it's obvious to take the focus and responsibility for learning away from the teacher and place it on the student. So teachers can ask students to weigh in on curricular choices where appropriate, ask them to engage in assessment practices, things like workshopping and self-assessments, and can even ask them to lead large sections of live sessions if this is something that you have available to you. Moving towards student-centered learning also moves away from assumptions about student placement and readiness, and this is one of the hallmarks of our school, but it can be used in a lot of educational settings. So instead of assuming that students know or can do certain things because of their age or grade, we can run diagnostics at the beginning of the school year that can actually show us what students actually do know instead of making those assumptions. We can then make adjustments to the curriculum and meet students where they are. We also want to move towards curricula that are flexible and offer multiple paths towards success. So students might have options about how they complete assignments, um, in some cases about the pacing of their work, or about the kinds of assessments that they want to use on their project. And importantly, student-centered learning focuses on student-generated questions. So instead of the teacher just giving the answers, the, the students are coming up with the questions. So it's inductive and curious by nature, and the pacing and scope of the cur curriculum can be adjusted based on those student questions. And finally, the role of the teacher has to change dramatically when it comes to student-centered learning. Rather than being that stage on the stage, or stage on the stage <laughs> where you provide information and answers, you'll want to become the guy on the side. So you're creating scaffolding, you're offering ideas, and you're pushing students to think deeper. 
the bottom line here is that student-centered learning isn't about you. It's about your students and what they can bring to your classroom. Uh, next slide, please. So fortunately, online learning environments are perfect for student-centered learning. Online learning creates or requires a good deal of self-direction and self-motivation to be successful. So pushing student-centered learning can result in more engagement, the kind of engagement that Carly was talking about, resulting in positive outcomes overall. So the curricula can be customized with various paths to better fit each student's zone of proximal development. And students can have a hand in designing course content, and uh, Tracy's gonna be talking about that in a little bit. Students can become responsible for creating multiple channels of communication, and the course content can be accessed at any time and from anywhere, which is one of the hallmarks of online learning. And this allows students to access the work exactly when they need it. Next slide, please. So just like Carly did, I'm going to discuss some synchronous and asynchronous options that we can use, but this is a good time for some, um, some interactions from the audience. So go ahead and in the chat box there, you can offer some ideas of how you are moving towards stu student-centered learning in your online learning environments or how you could see online learning being useful for student-centered uh, student -centered learning. So go ahead and toss some ideas out there. And I'll start offering some, uh, some suggestions here. So the, the biggest structural change you can make towards student-centered learning is to use the flipped model of learning, where most direct instruction, along with reading and writing, happens outside the live session period. And Tracy's going to talk a, a whole lot more about this in a, a couple of minutes. So humanities classrooms tend to be flipped by nature, uh, in that some and students usually have to do a lot of the work outside of the class in order to prepare. However, you can up the ante online by pre-recording direct instruction or asking students to view videos before class or do readings before class. That way, the entire live session can be devoted to student-led discussions and activities. Another great technique that you can use during synchronous sessions is the inductive model. So rather than using direct, direct instruction to just give students answers, you can ask students to categorize or organize information in order to come to a deeper understanding of a subject on their own. This model works really well for those of you who are history teachers or, or government teachers or um, that side of the, the humanities. So for example, students might notice various characteristics of empires that you've been studying in history in order to come to a class definition or a deeper understanding about what an empire actually is. And in class research where students might divide up uh, ideas and explore more about a particular topic before reporting back to the class can be part of the inductive method. And the final two examples on the synchronous side there, pre presentations and screen sharing, place control of the class firmly in the hands of the students. Students can become experts on certain aspects of a topic, or you can break up longer readings and ask students to lead discussion. Students can also be in charge of sharing resources or using the really neat annotation tools that are available on a lot of learning management systems, and they can guide the class in that way. And on the asynchronous side, students can be in charge of curating um, or even creating a lot of the materials used by the class. So discussion boards and flip grids and other asynchronous communication areas can be student-led spaces where they're responsible for asking questions and generating some interest. And we're going to talk more about workshops later, but asking older and more experienced students to take the reins there can lead to more student buy-in because they are in charge of the entire process. And with each of these techniques, you'll need to be present in order to offer advice or scaffolding or to prompt students if engagement is lagging. And remember, student-centered learning doesn't mean that the teacher is absent, as Carly discussed earlier. It's about establishing your presence and being there for the students when they need you. 